Why can't we live together? It's really good, eh? I love that record. From 1972, Why Can't We Live Together by the late Timmy Thomas, sampled 43 years later by my guest, producer 1985, to create one of the biggest pop songs of the last decade, Hotline Bling from Drake. Here's something I find interesting about you. You started out wanting to be Jimi Hendrix. Yes. Is that right? Correct. What's, what's, what's going on there? How do you go from, so did you play guitar? Yeah, that's where I, st- I, I would say that's where my musical journey started. I was maybe 11 or 12. I was at my uncle's house going through CDs. Yes, CDs. I'm not old. <laughs> Me too. Going through CDs. Uh, stumbled on the Jimi Hendrix experience. And I, my mind was blown. I was just like, what? What what is this? Like, what's happening here? He's doing all this and singing and, you know, and making up these songs. So I just kind of like did a deep dive. And within probably like a week, I told my parents, I was like, I need to get a guitar. <laughs> and did you get like a Stratocaster? Did you get the Jimi Hendrix guitar? Um, I had to get money first. So I ended up uh, delivering papers for a few months, saved up and went downtown to Steve's Music in Toronto yeah. on Queen Street. Yeah bought a guitar, and then proceeded to annoy my parents for the next few years just learning how to rock out. Did you get good? Like, could you play Lil Wing and could you play yeah. Hey yeah. Joe and all yeah, that stuff? Yeah, I, I, I got pretty good. So I, I was getting there. I just didn't actually have a path to becoming, you know, Jimi Hendrix. So how do you go from being playing Jimi Hendrix tunes to becoming a producer? Uh, that didn't happen for years. It wasn't. It, it definitely wasn't an immediate switch from. Oh, I think I'm going to be a rock star. To hey, let me start producing for people. When I first started playing, um, some of my best friends also played guitar, drums, things like that. We started a punk band, and at the time, I assumed anybody who was in a band was a songwriter. So I just taught myself how to write songs and how to arrange songs in my room. Because I was just thinking, this is what you do, you know. What was the name of the punk band you were in? Horrible names. We didn't have to go there. Come on, give me one. Give me one. <sighs> like coffee, double the cream, just <laughs> crazy. <laughs> we just, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I got so you. It was dark times. Thank you for letting me. Know. I can give you some bad, bad band names. I was in. We can. It's okay. Yeah. I get you. You know what it is. I understand what it's like. So. But you have this realization that oh, you, you start to think that oh, everyone who's in a band is writing their own songs. So I every day after school, I'm just writing songs and I'm writing the lyrics. I'm writing the guitar part. I'm writing the bass part. I'm writing the drum fills and doing all that. And then whenever we would have band, band practice, maybe two, three, two or three times a week at my friend's house, I would then sit there and kind of break down all the different pieces and show each person what you know what I had thought of and how we were going to play it. Right. And then you said that's sort of the beginnings of you starting to go like, oh, I understand the fundamentals. Well, I didn't know I understood it. I, it just came to me. I just thought it came to everybody. Right. And it wasn't until later when other people would be like, how do you do that? And I'm like, how do you not do it? Isn't it like, isn't it just a thing? Like, don't people just pick up guitars and play them? Right. And everybody's like, no, not at all. That's not how it works. So, so then like, is, is, is it that you go from doing that and then you realize, oh, you know, I have this computer in front of me. I can learn how to do it all on that. Oh, I can do this for other people. No, it was, uh, much less progressive, I would say. So years later, um, In high school, my high school girlfriend, her older brother was a DJ. So I would go by the house sometimes and I would always hear him playing music. And by then I had basically all but given up hope on my Jimi Hendrix dream. So I was like, you know what? I think DJing is the way to go. So one day I built up enough courage. I'm like, I'm going to go downstairs and ask him if he'll like teach me how to DJ. So his, his little like studio was in the basement. So I go, I knock on the door. He's like, what's up? I'm like... Uh, I froze. I didn't even know what to say. He's like, uh, you play guitar, right? I was like, yeah. He's like, do you mind playing guitar on the song for me? And I'm like, sure. Okay. I had no clue where it was going to go. I still hadn't built up the courage to ask him about DJing. So I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll go with it. You know, let me just like ease my way up to that. So I play guitar and then he's like, what about a bass line? I have a bass here. Do you think you could add something to it? And I'm like, 
yeah, sure. You know, like bass isn't my strongest instrument, but I'm down. I'll try it. First four notes of the guitar, first four strings of the guitar, you can make it work. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, I'll try it. I yeah. can do it. I've, mm-hmm. I've played a bass before. I own a bass, yeah. you know? So I'm like, okay, sure. I do that. And he's like, what about drums? And I'm looking around. I'm like, I don't see drums here. But yeah, I can play drums. I, you know, I've played drums in my church and it's whatever. It should be pretty easy. He's like, well, on this drum machine, all of the drums are broken down on these pads. I'm like, oh, so if I just push it, he's like, yeah, kick, snare, mm-hmm. hi hat, tom, wow. whatever. He's like, whatever you can think of, you can play it here. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay, I, I got it. That's that's cool. That's easy. Yeah. He's like, all right, cool. I'm gonna I'm a I'm gonna give you a count in, and then you're gonna play a drum loop. I was like, oh, so I just what play two bars, four bars. He's like, you tell me whatever you want. <laughs> he's like, I got you. You want four bars? You want two bars? I'll do that. I'll put it on loop. It'll just keep going, and then you can add to it. I'm like, oh, that's easy. So I do that. And then he goes, you just produced your first song. Wow. So I'm like, wow. I'm like, what? What? Like, what does this mean? <laughs> wow. What a great story. Yeah. Literally, that's how I started producing. Wow. So then I'm like, okay, uh, I think I can do this because I just did it without planning it. But I'm like, how do I do it? Like, if I don't have a drum machine. So for the first little bit, whenever I was at their house, I would kind of just like, sneak away from my girlfriend and be like, yeah, I'll be back. <laughs> and then I would just go hang out with him and be producing music. And, and you were like, I can never break up with his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> because if I do, I lose access to the drum machine. We're still great friends to this day. <laughs> Okay, good, good, good. And, um, you do have your own drum machine now, though, I hope. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. Okay, good. But I don't use them because of computers. <laughs> oh, right. Of course, <laughs> yeah. of course. Of but course. Yeah. that was the introduction into me thinking, well, how can I do this without getting a drum machine? And he's like, well, you can do it on certain computer programs. If you get a computer and you know you learn the program, you can do the same thing in the program. So I hijacked my parents' computer. That was the start of me just like taking over. Downloaded <laughs> like, Fruity Loops or something like that? I downloaded uh, a bootleg version of Cubase. Okay. I had no clue what I was doing. Yeah. And I was just like, I'm just going to try to do whatever I was doing on his MPC on this computer. And from there, that's basically how I started producing. And you got pretty intense at it, about hours and hours a day, I bet. Hours. Hours and then when I started to get to a point of thinking the beats are good, but how do I, like, where do I go from there? I would actually um, go to other DJ friends and ask them for acapellas, so that I could actually make a song. You would ask other DJ friends for for uh, I should point out for people who don't know that isolated vocals, vocals isolated, without any yes. vocals without any without any music around without it. any music around them, so that. I and could then build around it. Of already established songs, songs that you knew. Yeah, songs that I knew, songs yeah. that I didn't know. That, But I was just so used to the band format where I'm just like, I need, this needs, it's not a song. Right. You know, these beats are cool, but they're just loops until I can make it a song. So that's where I, I think I've really started to shape my production style yeah. was by using these vocals and then also because they had been songs before trying to figure out how can i do something different than what they had done before with these records i find it interesting that you say that you shaped your production style because i find your production style and the way you talk about it really interesting and i thought one of the ways we could talk about that is by listening to some of the songs you've you've worked on over the years let's listen to one of them right now i got my eyes on you you're everything that i see i won't show high love and emotion it's a little bit of Hold On, We're Going Home from Dre featuring uh, Majid Jordan, one of the many huge hits from my guest, Grammy award-winning producer in 1985. The Canadian producer joins me in the studio. So let's talk Let's talk about your production style through this song. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about how, like what you got, the song idea, and, and how it became what we heard, what we're hearing right now. Um, this is a crazy song because, or a crazy, crazy situation because this is the very first time I had ever worked with Magic Jordan who are still some of my closest friends that was like this is literally the very first time we met each other in person right we started working on ideas not really knowing what we were working towards or where it would go and we stumbled on this idea and it sounded completely different before this and, you know, shout out to both of them, Majid and Jordan. The, the way they both think is so 
creatively inspiring. Yeah. That I, w- I was kind of just like watching in awe, like, oh, these guys are really, really good. They and, had that hook? They had the, I got my eyes on you? Um, we had different pieces of the song. It didn't get finished until Drake came in, but we had pieces of the song. And um, the melody and stuff, we were working it out. And then out of nowhere... Jordan plays a house version of the song that's like 124 BPM, like like that speed. And I'm like, the music is so beautiful, but it's I think it's a little bit too fast for people to get into. Yeah. I was like, what if you bring it right down to like 100? Which normally for a house song, you wouldn't even think of that. because it's, it's, it's too slow. It's, it's way too slow. But when we did that, instantly everybody was like, ah. Like it, it was like the aha moment because it just felt so different. That's why when you hear the record, literally from those drums, doo, 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 it sounds like something different is happening. And that's why to this day, people still reference that record. I think so much of it's because it wasn't meant to be at that speed. Right. So when you bring it down 24 BPM or 20, 28 BPM, whatever it is, it just has such a different energy. Right. That's, that and, song could have been played a lot faster. It could have been a bigger yeah. house record, but you made a decision to buck the sort of trend around yeah. ha- music that would be played in clubs and house music that would be played. Exactly. You knocked it down about 24, 25 BPM. It's a slower groove, and it's that groove that kind of helps it take off. Yeah, and, and I think that um, is a testament to my style overall as a producer. Which is why? So much of my production comes from taking things that don't normally belong together whether it's tempos different uh styles different samples i kind of have this way i probably make it harder for myself because i could be a little bit more direct sometimes but i'm always thinking like what things shouldn't fit together and how would i make those work we're going to talk about that in the in the context of a of a division song in a second and um, and a couple of the other big songs in a second when you first started working with Drake, like what's I, I, I don't know anything about this guy. Like I mean, I know about him as, as what people know about him from you know I, I watch his Twitch streams and mm-hmm. listen, listen to his your records. Mm-hmm. What's his process like in the studio? What's like as a producer? I'm always really interested in how producers interact with the artists they're working with. Drake is by far one of the most talented artists I've ever worked with. Like not even close because his art his um, his ability as a uh, songwriter and lyricist also matches his ability to produce. Drake is one of the best producers of the, in the game, hands down. Right. Because the way he's able to see where a song should or shouldn't go and then articulate that to a producer is incredible. Drake really could produce his albums. Right. You know, like that's the that's the thing about Drake. Why that's why he can keep making these hits cuz it sort of doesn't matter who's involved as long as that person is able to like follow his vision enough cuz so, he'll 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 get it there for sure. So when you're working with him what you don't want to do is be like, "Nah," or I don't think so. Well, he's he's open to it. You know, we've had the back and forth and I'm probably one of the few people who've worked close enough that we've actually been in the studio and and talked through records as opposed to just sending an idea and he he comes back with a hit. So I've seen I've seen both of those sides to it. For instance, uh when we did uh One Dance, yeah. I had made a full version of the record, worked on it for hours. Yeah. Well, of of the beat. It wasn't a song, of the beat, worked on it for hours and I'm like, "Oh man, this is it." I call him into the room, I'm all excited. I'm like, he, "He's going to love it for sure." Yeah. He listens, he stops, he kind of like looks away blankly. And I'm like, this isn't the response I was expecting. (laughs) So I'm like, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? And he's like, the music is perfect. The drums are wrong. So in my head, I'm like, damn. (laughs) Can we, can we, we we have one dance there, don't we, Sam? Can we, can we just play a little bit of it? Grips on your ways, front way, back way. You know that I don't play. Street's not safe, but I never run away. Even when so this piano I'm hearing, just keep going there. This is the same that you would have given him. It's, it's the, the, all of the music, the non-rhythmic instruments were yeah. the same. Keep, keep, it, keep it up and tell me what the drums sounded like when you gave it to him. Uh, the drums sounded much closer to another record I did for Drake called Truffle Butter. Okay. Which was a lot more, 
I guess, uh, rap or hip hop inspired. So it didn't have this drum rhythm we're hearing. No, right the, now. the okay. drums were completely different. Okay. I was kind of hoping you would do the, you would do the drums for me and tell me what they sounded like. All right, well, uh, that's, I, was, I was trying my best there. Okay, so you you get from him. He, he, he you, there's a back and forth there. You yeah. know, like this is not you know, and, but and he has this. Sort but of it's vision. very short because right. he's just like he's staring off in the distance. And he's like, yeah, you killed it with the music. Yeah, drums are wrong, and then he walks away. I heard he um, I heard he likes to work late at night. Is that right? Like overnight? Yeah, he's a night owl for sure. Like his. His work day starts at like eight or nine p.m. and ends at anywhere between five to eight in the morning. How's that for you? You ever get tired? You ever? You ever... It's the worst for me because I'm also an early bird. So no matter what time I go to sleep, if the sun is up, I'm up. Right. So you just end up going through these long periods of like two or three hours of sleep a day. It's funny to think about one dance because, you know, I think we're in this era right now where pop music is this intersection of R&B and reggaeton and hip hop and dance hall and Afrobeat. Um, where do you think that one dance lands in kind of starting that shift to where pop music is now? It, I think, is one of the catalysts for the international appreciation that people have for music right i'm not gonna obviously we don't own that that is you know that's just a a result of the internet i would say yeah but the different worlds that intersected on that record was something that i don't think it happened in the way it happened before that and i'll give a lot of credit to drake on that because indirectly he influenced that i remember we had a conversation and he was discussing how the year before he had been out in, I think it was Dubai for an event and huge, huge crowd, you know, tens of thousands of people. Yeah, yeah. He plays his hits. He says everybody sings the words, but they're not reacting because in other parts of the world, if you can't make people dance, it kind of doesn't, there's no connection. Right. So if they're not actually dancing to the records, how successful are you? They yeah. know you and yeah. they recognize you, but if you haven't made them move, it's kind of like, okay, cool. We're now waiting for our music that we danced to. Right. So right. He, he had told me this in the conversation in passing. So when he told me the drums are wrong, yeah. instantly in my head, I'm like, okay, well, what, what would make people from many different places of the world dance simultaneously. And it's so funny that the song <laughs> ended up becoming called One Dance because we never had that conversation. Right. We never spoke about it being a song for people to dance to or any of those things. But like go going back to what you were saying before about your production style being taking things that don't typically work together or maybe I should say historically work together and bringing them together to bringing them together, I'm just fighting with the microphone, bringing them together and, and making something new out of them mm -hmm. and making them work. Is that what happens with that song? Are you, are you listening to reggaeton? Are you listening to dance hall? 100%, are you listening? because this is before reggaeton had the boom it's having now as far as like the rest of the world appreciating it. Yeah, so you were just Obviously, listening. it's huge in its community. Yeah. It's, you know, the biggest thing. But the rest of the world didn't really give it the respect or the ears it, it should have had. Yeah. So... I kind of was like, you know what? If I can borrow from this in a way that isn't necessarily obvious, because the weird thing is most people think it's Afrobeat on the record, which is not. It's it's clearly me dipping into the reggaeton pool. So I was like, if I can borrow from this in a way that it speaks to that culture, I feel like because of the sample, it's a... It's a well-known uh, funky house sample from the UK because it then ends up having Wizkid on it, who's a well-known Afrobeat artist. We've now connected four different worlds wow. simultaneously because you have an American to the world, an Americanized hip hop artist. Drake. Yes. You have the UK influence, you have the Afrobeat influence, and then you also have reggaeton. Wow. So you without people knowing, you've kind of just mixed the whole 
music scene in one song. Yeah, and it doesn't sound contrived. It, it doesn't, doesn't sound like that's what you're trying to do. It doesn't sound like an experiment. It just no. sounds like, oh, this is a great, great record. That's so smart. That's so smart. Uh, Sam, can we can we throw back to September fifth? So that's uh, September 5th, the title track to the debut release that introduced the world to the Toronto R&B duo Division, consisting of singer Daniel Daly and my guest, producer 1985. But I want to play something else. So, these, so it's worth mentioning that your relationship with Daniel started before Division. For sure. Uh, matter of fact, just take a listen to this. I see you over there, and I don't want to stare. I think that that you're a man, but you didn't care. You made up your mind, girl, leaving with me. You said you want to see. That is Girlfriend, as sung by Daniel Daly, also produced by, my guess, 1985, released back in 08. Why are you laughing? Because I haven't heard that song in at least 10 or more Turn years. it up a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> what go, what's going through your mind when you listen to that now? Production sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It sounds good. It's it's ambitious, but it sounds like there's so many things that would change now. Right. Yeah. Right. But so you hear you hear your past mistakes for sure. If you don't mind me saying, big song in the city. It did well. It did really well. We we had a moment. We we definitely we um. I think at that time we were so young and not knowing what to do, where to go, where to where to turn or where to look towards that um, I don't even know if we knew what we were getting into at the time, you know, career wise. I mean, here's my question about this. This is this is what I'm curious to, about this. So for people who don't know Division, that. That song we just heard was released as a Daniel Daly song mm-hmm. produced by you, right? Same two people, mm-hmm. Daniel Daly and you, yep. 1985. It gets you a bit of buzz. It does okay, as you mentioned, right? But obviously it doesn't do well as as well as Division has done. Like Division yeah. has kind of blew up in a pretty major way. But the difference is, is that no one, as far as I know, not even Drake knew who Division was. No. Division, it was the same two dudes I just mentioned. Yeah. But they were, they were, they were, no one knew who you were. No one who, no one knew who was making this music as Division. It was a mysterious entity. Do you think that mystery helped? Um, yeah, for sure. The mystery helped. The, the way music was being circulated helped a lot because that was right in the middle of like the SoundCloud boom Mm -hmm. where, it was almost like way cooler to tell your friend like, yo, I heard this thing on SoundCloud. You don't know about it yet. And then that's how it gets spread as opposed to back when we did those early records. The only reason the only reason you would really hear it is because you caught it on the radio. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you didn't catch it on the radio, there was no there was no way to share it amongst people like in the way that you can share music now where most of it is done online yeah. and through cell phones and through everything besides the radio. The radio in a, in a lot of ways is almost the result of what has happened online. Yeah, the radio is trying to catch up exactly. with what people are yeah. actually listening to as opposed yeah. to creating the conversation. Yeah, so that made a big difference. And then I think sometimes packaging and presentation really changes how, how you digest something the way it's presented to you really makes you look at it differently, you know? And I think because we presented Division in a way where all you could do was get into the music, that little bit of mystery and intrigue made people that much hungrier for this thing. Because they, they didn't really know what it was. They didn't know if I was the singer. They didn't know if it was a bunch of different singers because we, we've we used other voices on the songs. Yeah. They didn't know where we were from. And that was intentional? You were like, hey, Daniel, let's be let's be mysterious. Let's not let anybody know who we are. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily like, let's be mysterious. It was more like, let's let people only grab onto the music because right now, because in that moment, the way music was being shared, 
it was so um, coveted. You know, there there was a big thing about being the first blog to post something, to be, to be the first person to discover Frank Ocean or, you know, that type of energy is different now because everything's everywhere. But mm -hmm. that type of energy in the early SoundCloud and kind of just like the early days of streaming in general where nobody even fully knew what streaming was going to be. You know, I remember bands were saying, like, you're not allowed to stream my music <laughs> because I feel like that's gonna kill the sales. Kill sales, yeah, kill I mean, the people record. Are still saying that, by yeah. the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that whole time, that time frame kind of changed the way people were listening. And, and you saw that, you saw that this is an opportunity. For sure. You saw that there's a trend, that people are, are, are wanting to own something new. Yeah. Uh, and take ownership of something new. They want. They want to. They want to have a bit of mystery around what they're listening to. They well, want to feel yeah. that only they have it. And you were smart enough to go. Let's take advantage of that. One hundred percent. Man, that's pretty 100%, good. One hundred percent. Because I, I, I don't know. It, it might have been like that in other changes in music, whether it was from like tape to CD or, but I wasn't old enough for those things. So I, I, I don't really know how people reacted. Yeah. So this was the first time I was actually seeing like, oh, music, this thing I love is taking on a different life because of the way people are gonna consume it. They're gonna look at it so much differently because now it went from being CDs to possibly MP3s and yeah. iPods and, even even being able to have music on your phone is a completely you could never just walk with music before yeah and then all of a sudden things start changing and music is so accessible that it almost became cool to have the first access to something and yeah. to be the person or the people to be like oh this is our community you guys don't know about the weekend <laughs> you know like there was there was a lot of that energy yeah. of like oh he's ours yeah so seeing that i was like oh perfect why don't we just give them that why don't we give give people something that if you're one of the early consumers it feels personal because it is us it's it's us and our three fans it's us and our seven fans i'm and going to sacrifice fans. the traditional method of like getting on a major label and getting blasted yeah. out as many people as possible yeah because i know that if i go small for people who owe me at the beginning it'll mean more to them and, and it does yeah. you know to this day you see those the diehard September 5th fans almost like upset, like, oh, we knew of Division before all of you, <laughs> you know? Like there is that kind of like us against them mentality. And I, I love it. Let, let me ask you another question about kind of how things used to be and, and how things are now yeah. with regards to production. Okay. So, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty normal now to see a lot of producers credited on one song. Mm -hmm. you know, we were talking before we came in here just about how, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, that wasn't necessarily the case. There was like a Timbaland production of a, uh, you know, yeah. there was a Neptunes production of a, uh, you know, like there was, there was one Dr. Dre production of a, uh, you, and there was a style associated with that one producer. Now, these days, we can see a number of producers on a song, including yourself, like you mm -hmm. collaborate with other producers. Yeah. What, what do you think has changed? I think one of the biggest changes is, A, it's way more accessible to be a producer. Before, if you couldn't afford multiple keyboards, a drum machine, studio time, you couldn't play. You know, it, it really was a pay to play. So if you couldn't, it's like if you wanted to be a DJ and you couldn't afford turntables, you're, you're just a guy that likes music. You know, you're just, <laughs> yeah. literally, you're, you're an just, enthusiast. Yeah, I get you know, it. you're the, you're the young woman who would love to mix those records together, but you can't right. because there's no access to it. So as the access opened up, it instantly opened the floodgates to all of these people who some might end up doing it professionally, but most don't can kind of participate in this art form that they love. You know, and then from there, you start finding that because it's becoming more inclusive, people don't have to be the person to do everything. Because before, if you're a producer, most producers back in the day play like seven instruments and they're like phenomenally gifted. Yeah, I've seen those videos of Kanye playing piano, playing keyboard, just playing a lot of different instruments yeah. at the same time. Yeah, right. Because you had to be the anomaly to even make it because there's 
such limited access, you have to be the person that's going to be like, you know what, I'm going to save up $4,000 for this drum machine, another $2,000 for the other equipment that goes with it. And from there, that dedication alone meant you're way further ahead than any of your friends being like, oh, let me casually try to do this. So now that people can casually do it, you start finding people who casually become really good. <laughs> you know, like they they might have just started as a hobby and, and find out like, oh, I'm really, really good at making drums. I'm really, really good at making piano loops, whatever it may be. But I don't necessarily have to do everything because okay. I have a friend who is amazing at this thing. So me and my friend together, it's like a band. You know, before there were bands. Now the band is multiple producers. Wow. It's multiple people putting together ideas. If you were in a band, as I think you were, yeah. if you were in a band, yeah. you and three, four, five friends gather in somebody's house, annoying somebody's parents, mm -hmm. and just start jamming. You know, one guy's on guitar, one guy's on drums, one guy's on bass, maybe somebody's on keyboard, and then one guy puts up his hands like, I'll sing. <laughs> you know, like, exactly. I'll go for it. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah know? Like, exactly. Yeah. Everybody's looking around that, the room. That was me. <laughs> everybody's yeah. looking around the room yeah. like, ah, all right. I'll do it, go. sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, but there's no direction. You find the direction. And that's where I think production is gone because all of those people are now finding new ways to like approach the the creation process right. and that's now on computers and it doesn't take as much physical equipment because you can kind of do it you can go you can go on online and download any sound you need yeah you know before you couldn't yeah you had to buy the sound you had to sample the sound you had to have a crazy record collection and go through hundreds of records to find drum loops to then cut up so you can have your kick, snare, whatever, and then put those back together. Now you just sign up for Splice, you know, yeah. pay a certain amount per month, hundreds of thousands of sounds at your fingertip, and then you can kind of pick and choose like, well, I was never that great at melodies, but I'm really good at rhythm. I love this so much. I love the idea of a production, a group, a group of producers being like a band that can do a bunch of different things. But I'm also stuck on what you said about how, you know, you, you don't have to go into your record collection. You don't have to go to these old songs. You can make them now. But one of your biggest songs, and just one of the biggest songs that will ever come from Canada, came from an older record. Just take a listen to this. From 1972, Why Can't We Live Together by the late Timmy Thomas, sampled 43 years later by my guest, producer 1985, to create one of the biggest pop songs of the last decade, Hotline Bling from Drake. <sighs> huge, huge, huge shout out to Timmy Thomas and his family. He uh, passed away not too long ago. I actually had the pleasure of talking to him on the phone a couple years ago. Um, I was down in Miami, a friend of mine knew Timmy Thomas because he used to work in radio and him and Timmy Thomas were, were good friends. And when he found out that I was one who made Hotline Bling, he said, oh, I'll call him for you one day. I thought nothing of it. I saw him again and he's like, I'm gonna call Timmy right now. So he calls him and the first thing he says to me is, thank you, you changed me and my family's life. I'm like, wow. Because this is a song, like, as you said, 40 years old right and at the time i think he was he was a recently retired school teacher right wow and then you technically end up having one of the biggest songs in the world out of nowhere yeah. which is like the beauty of music because it doesn't it never expires like once it's out in the world who knows who's going to hear the record sample it borrow a line whatever it is 
but it's forever connected to the original creator. Right. And so so not only was his life changed that this song got really big and that, you know, it, it, his legacy was sealed, but also I'm sure financially for him and his oh, family, yeah, for sure. he, was, That's, he was taken care of. That's game changing. That's a... Uh, that must have meant so much to you to hear that. Yeah, because I'd, I'd never... You almost never have that connection if you sample a record. It right. kind of goes through publishing companies, record labels, all of that stuff, and it becomes very much like um, just business ended. Right. There's no no human interaction to it. So to actually hear this person who so many years before had put this record out, you know, I'm sure by the time the song got to him, he's probably like, "How?" <laughs> you know, yeah, like, I mean, that was a big record when it first came out. That yeah. did well. Yeah. But obviously he had to work and, yeah. and all that other stuff, you know? Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm sure in his mind he's thinking, like, what like, what brought wow. you guys to me? Like, where, <laughs> where does this come from? So you make a beat based on that mm -hmm. um, and sample that. Yeah. And um, I'm curious, like, when Drake took it on vocally, was it the place you thought it was going to go? Absolutely not. I thought he was just going to make a rap song and it would just be a... Um, uh, you know, just another record, a cool song, but never this. So I remember the first time he played it for me, I was almost confused because I was expecting him to just rap. So I'm like, oh, this is different. You he know, started like, singing that part. Yeah, and he, um, he plays it one time, and I almost had like no reaction because I was digesting it. Because I was literally going into it expecting to hear something completely different than what he did. So I'm like, oh, wow, you know, like, okay. And it, like, took me a second to, to digest. We're in the studio, and then um, there's a bunch of us in the room. Everybody's talking. Everybody continues to do whatever they're doing. I leave to go to get a drink from the kitchen. As I'm walking to the kitchen, I'm singing the whole song back, and I'm like, ah. Oh. He's a genius. <laughs> I'm like, oh, he he does it again. Like he wow. he did it because I was like, wait a second. I've only heard the song once, and I'm singing the whole song back, like I've been playing it for years. Is that stuff just off the top of his head? Did he have that stuff in him? Was he? Did he? He's he... just a an encyclopedia of uh, melody and lyric. He just had it. He heard that thing, and he just started singing. He just does stuff. That stuff. Yeah. Some of the things I've seen him do and then seeing where the songs go and what ends up happening with it, I'm just like, oh, this guy's really, 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 really good on a different level. Because I've worked with so many different other artists and his style and range is so different too. So S Speaking of a different level, when did you, that song hits on a different level. I mean, that song is, like I said, will go down as one of the biggest songs ever to come out of this country. One of the biggest hip hop songs of all time. When did you know that it had become this massive thing? When did I know it had become a massive thing? Yeah. You knew it might, because you told I, me you were singing I, it in the hallway. I knew it was massive, but I didn't... It, that song came out in, in a really weird time for Drake, because he had so many other things happening at the same time. He had released it in this pack of like three records. One song was like a, a diss song when he had a- Yeah, I remember. You know, he had a whole thing going on. So there's a lot of things that were distracting away from that being the kind of like moment that in my head I was like, oh, I think it's gonna be a moment. But I love that it, it just kind of got put in this like mix of things because then you really got to see like, oh, this is gonna stand the test of time because as it's being released with other Drake records, you know, it's not like other people's records, his own records, you're starting to see it slowly bubbling and rising to the top. And um, I think it was maybe a week after the song was released, he did it at OVO Fest, he debuted it and I remember just kind of looking around and seeing everybody else having the same reaction as me. Kind of just like a a bewildered like, oh, what is this? This is different. You know, kind of that like initial like not necessarily confusion, but just like a it's almost just like an appreciation of like, oh wow, that's this is cool. Yeah. 
you know. But it was. It's not to say that the the reaction was like, oh my god, this is, you know, this is the hit. But yeah. you could still kind of see people taking it in for whatever that meant. Like yeah. you could actually visibly see people having like a awe moment of like a. Hmm. But it did get really big. It got huge. It got massive. It got huge. And then over the next weeks and months, I start to see it kind of taking on. A, you know what? I'll say the turning point for me was the video. Yeah. Because before then, the song had started to take on a life of its own. But with the video, it became interactive for people. It became memes. Yeah. It became... Parodies. Yeah. It became... Um, Almost like a social moment. Yeah, I remember. Culturally. I remember them putting the um, people put a tennis racket into his yeah, hand in became, the video. So it became could... so many things. Yeah, and because people enjoyed the song at the same time, it worked hand in hand. Where there's other records where the video might do that, but then the song or the music doesn't necessarily live up to the hype of what the video is. And because both literally worked hand in hand. I think it just took on another life. We had presidents speaking about it, and it was, yeah, still to this day, probably one of the most talked about songs of the last at least decade, for sure. So answer me this. It, it, it gets so big. Presidents are talking about it. I guess Obama talked about it. The, yeah. The, I um, think, yeah, I think even Trump ended up doing something about it. Yeah, I have some, some recollection of that, too. And, um, and, you know, then it becomes a meme. It becomes a parody. I, I've, I've had the fortune and the honor to be able to ask this question to a couple of people, you know, what happens when your song gets this big, you know, and oftentimes they would, people would say to me, um, it doesn't really feel like it's mine anymore. It like, I, 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 it sounds like a foreign song to me, you know, like I forget that I even ha had anything to do with it. Given that it's a, let's be honest, it's a piece of art that you helped create, you mm -hmm. and Drake created. Can you still listen to it like that? Um, that's a great question. Yes, but probably for different reasons than people would expect. I made that record in my parents' basement. So every time I hear the song, it literally makes me think like, whoa, look at, look at where my life has taken me. You know, from sitting in my parents' basement, making this beat, having no clue what it could be, to now I've been to so many different cities and countries around the world and heard this music and then also seeing the reaction of how other people are enjoying it. You know, I, I think I'm forever grateful and blessed for that. You know, that's the one thing where people, I think, it maybe expect you to get used to it, but I almost don't want to ever get used to it because I, I never want to lose the feeling of knowing where I came from and knowing what it took to get to, you know, these different milestones. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. I mean, on a couple of levels. One is that the song was not made in a ma massive studio. No, it was made not at all. Created in your parents' it's basement. My parents' basement, unfinished. I was hanging a piece of tarp as a wall. <laughs> you know, it was just. It is what it is, you know? I also think it just speaks to like eras of, and I think maybe yours is an underrated era of, of Toronto hip hop, of indie music in Canada in general. Because we were talking about this beforehand, you know, you have you have the early days of like Maestro, Dream Warriors, mm -hmm. Mishimi, then you have like Cardinal and Socrates, that yeah. kind of era. And now, you know, there's like there's like Drake and, and The Weeknd and mm -hmm. that sort of, of, I think we're around the same age, like of our, our time. But that like, 2000s, like late 2000s, when you guys were not famous yet, um, you and, and Boy Wonder and other artists like this, like that's a pretty formative time for, for, sure. for music. For sure. I think for one, it shaped the music scene in Canada, but I think we also in many ways shaped the music scene just in general, you know, as a blanket statement because something about Drake and what he represents to the world musically made people feel a little bit more um, attached to his process. He, I, I can't fully put my finger on it, but I feel like something about Drake makes people feel like the average person has a chance musically. Because 
his come up has been so relatable because he's been so documented because he's been so honest and transparent you'd like you can literally be walking down the street and people would recognize his parents where yeah. the average artist you wouldn't you couldn't have said that before where you'd be like oh there's Dennis Graham you know like and people are like oh you know like something about Drake has made the general public feel more ownership to him as an artist than a lot of other superstar artists because his superstardom will go down in history with the biggest ever. Yeah. But the other people that are considered the biggest didn't feel like you could reach out and touch them as much as you can with Drake. I mean, I think that goes to you, though. I think that goes to the producers. I mean, uh, you have Michael Jackson, who's going to be gone down in history and has gone down in history as one of the greatest ever. I mean, Thriller was made with Quincy Jones, who had already made a lot of really, really big mm -hmm. records, you know? I mean, we were just talking about... Um, Timbaland, you know, th th these are a lot of younger artists or new artists would start out working with Timbaland or would like get a major label behind them and they'd start working with Rick Rubin or they'd start working with Dr. Dre, right? You know, but in your case, y you're right. Maybe Drake's rise is so relatable to so many young people or just in people in general because he was working with people who, like them, were making records in their parents' basement. Yeah. yeah. That's where those and songs came from. He's, um, you know, despite the the bravado he has to put out on record. Mm -hmm. He's remained so incredibly uh, grounded, you know, so, um, I guess, realistic to who he is and what he represents, where he doesn't take himself too seriously outside of the artist, you know? And, and I think that's what's given him this, like, very human ability to maintain where he's at and to understand how people take him, you know, like. But, you, but you're also saying that the Toronto producer sensibility, that all, all of it is you know, part of the reason that that thing blew yeah, up. Yeah, and it's so hard to explain because I'm, I guess, in many ways in the middle of it, but him knowing, okay, instead of going for the big producer, let me go to that guy right there because this guy has a different ear. You know, and that's why I'm saying he's one of the best producers, because to know <laughs> it's hard to do it once. It's hard to do it twice. To do it like 35 times, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like, and that's him. He's done it more than 35 times at this point. And that there is something to definitely be said for his ability to kind of understand the roles that different people can play and how people contribute to his sound and how he can contribute to what they're doing. And even um, his love and respect for 40 in his process, yeah. you know, as kind of like the, the uh, quality controller, you know, to, to give it a, a turn. Sure. Yeah. You yeah. know, cause that is such a huge part of it. Where so you're telling me even when you made Hotline Bling, it had to go through 40. It doesn't have to go through. But it does. But it does just based on like Drake's um, trust in the people around him. Right. You know, so he kind of always has the people that he leans on, whether it's, you know, just like a simple text of a song to somebody that he knows what their ears like, you know, just to, you know, tell me what you think, mm -hmm. you know, that very loose conversation can turn into be like, yeah, I played it for this person who I, you know, I like to get their opinion on it. And I think they're right. The way that this part here happened, I feel like we can maybe adjust that a bit, you know, or it's like, you are the biggest star. You really don't need anybody's opinion on it. Whatever you say will go and can't go, but you're still opening yourself up to that. You know, you're still having no problem with saying, look, 40, you know, I still need you to weigh on this song. You might not have produced anything on the record, yeah. but I still need your, your ears on this. Do yeah. I sound good? Yeah. Does this work? Yeah. Should this be changed? Yeah. Does the mix work? Like for instance, a song like, um, hold on, we're going home. Yeah. 
before that song was finished, I sat with 40 one day and he basically just broke down how at the time it was going to be Drake's biggest pop song. I was like, how do you know? He's like, I just know. He's like, you know, like once you've, when you've done this for long enough, you just know. I'm like, okay, so like now what? He's like, well, because I know it's going to be his biggest pop song at that stage in his career, he said, I made the mixing choice to make this sonically much heavier than a traditional pop song so that he still stays grounded outside of the pop world because he's not he's not in the space where he can sacrifice his artistry or the way people view him outside of the pop world you know because it it's a very fickle line to walk on both sides because a, a lot of artists it's like once you go pop people are like nah sold out yeah you belong to the machine now you yeah. belong to you're the radio yeah the radio guy now yeah. you know we we can't look at it the same way as when you were just making you know well we owned you a little bit when, yeah when, when, when you were just making the us, rap yeah. songs we wanted you to make yeah you're one of them now yeah and it's a very, very, very real thing that we've seen happen to so many artists. Mm -hmm. Once you cross over, most can't come back. Mm -hmm. You've made the cross. You mm -hmm. know, you you stepped into the pool, mm -hmm. your feet are wet now. Mm -hmm. This is this is dry land. You can't come back. Mm -hmm. you you know, stay there. And hearing forty being so like aware of that, I was like, Oh, I get it. These guys are really, really good. This is not an accident. This they they understand why certain things work, why other things don't work, why certain things can be mixed, why some things maybe shouldn't be mixed. And I was like, okay, that's like a, that's a very extreme amount of self-awareness on everybody's part, you know, on 40's part to know like, there's a reason why Drake entrusts me with his career. And for Drake to know there's a reason mm. why I've, you know, always leaned on you for these things because you're going to come back and tell me something like that where I might not have, you know, the average artist isn't going to be thinking, well, you know, this is a huge pop song. Do we mix it differently than other pop songs yeah. and make sure it stays in the urban club? So that he can't be, conf he can't be accused of crossing over and so, that he's not lost to that other side. Yeah, yeah. So that yeah. when it plays with his other much heavier records, it's not like, ah, that's too light. You got to, you know, and because of that, you know, 40 literally told me going into it, he's like, he said, basically, we might be sacrificing how far it goes at pop radio without people knowing that. Because pop radio has a sound and the people who control pop radio know the sound and understand the sound. So... Doing this, you might be sacrificing how far it can go in the pop world and, and in that space, but as long as he remains integral in his true home, that's a sacrifice that you got to be willing to make. And for me as a young producer, I was like mind blown. I was like, yo, these guys are like scientists. I've never been <laughs> I'm just like, yo, I'm just here making beats. <laughs> like, what, like, what is that? And so those early lessons for me, I really start to understand why they have done yeah. it 100 plus times, you know. Can you pick a song off the Division new I like the new record a lot by the way. Pick a song off of that? Yeah, I like it a lot. Thank you. Can you pick a song off of that record to play? We're going to play it on the way out of this interview. Um, any song? Well, one from the record would be nice. No, but it can be any song. It can be any song. Take it any direction. Um, yeah, I, sometimes I like to do this because it gives people a chance to play something that's not the single or, you know. True. Okay. Something that's not the single, I will go with... Um, Whatever it is, you're going to have to tell me about it. I will go with a song called Tired. And that song is... I think in my opinion, that song is maybe the most reminiscent of the early September 5th division. It feels very, uh, I don't wanna say quintessential, quintessential division, but it feels like the division that people kind of 
came to know and love. And as we've been progressing, you know, that's one thing that we definitely do a lot. You can hear it every album. We It almost sounds like we're taking on a new form. And I think that's one of the records on this album that feels like a throwback to where we literally started. So let's, let's play that one. Tired. Here's Tired off our new album, Working on My Karma. You just set it up for me? That was great. There we go. Thanks for doing it. What a radio pro <laughs> here, man. Uh, lovely to meet you. You too. Thanks we for coming. We got to do this again. Yeah, let's do it whenever you want. Thank you.